So, uh, you know, we, we talked yesterday and, and this morning about, you know, how to build all the mechanical components, but, you know, a lot of that is, hey, you know, you built a, a go-kart, you built a, uh, you know, if you have some race car experience and things like that, you know how to do those things. Now we get into the parts that are relevant to solar car racing, which is, how do you power the solar car? Okay. So uh, we'll talk about uh, the solar array, we'll talk about power trackers, we'll talk about motors and controllers. Okay, so in terms of a solar array, you have another trade you have to consider. Do you want to use a flat array? And when we talk about a flat array, we're talking in general about a flat array that's above the car. That, 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 that is encompassing of the entire area of that you are legally allowed to have with the solar array. Versus if you have a curved array, you're talking about uh, the array that's sort of uh, what we call wing in body, the idea that it's on the surface of a, of a curved body. Um, you've got a hole that's uh, cut out for a cockpit, so you're not using up all your area. Now, there, there is a consideration you have to have in terms of how solar panels work. You tend to wire solar panels in series with one another to boost up the voltage. The downside to that, even though you have to do it, the downside to that is if you were to shade any one panel, all the other panels in the same series also are essentially shaded because it, when you wire things in series, you're, you're, you're going to have the same current flow through that entire string, which means if I cover, let's say, a quarter of a panel, I now have only 75% of my current for that one panel, and I'm going to have 75% of the current for all the remaining uh, things in the, in the, in the chain. So when you think about that, and you think about uh, flat versus curved, well, if I had a curved design that goes, you know, like this, well, I have, if I had the sun overhead, sure, I may have, you know, the same amount of sun on both the front and the back, per se, but let's say the sun's over here. I've got more sun on the side that's curving out towards the sun, and I have a lot less energy going away from the sun. If I wired those two sets of panels in series with one another, I'm only going to get the power from the panels away from the sun. Even up front, they're just going to get that same level of power. So uh, I was having a conversation outside with the pictures uh, yesterday. This is why you will see multiple power trackers. We'll talk about that in a sec. Multiple power trackers and multiple zones. The idea is that you would have uh, multiple strings of panels in series that you can associate with a, the sun's angle. Okay. okay. Uh, the other thing that you have to consider is uh, pre-made versus custom panels. Okay. Uh, pre-made panels are very uh, reliable. They're meant to be you know, mounted on the roof of your house that can take hail and rain and all sorts of things. So uh, you really could almost throw them around and, and, and you would have no problems. Um, and of course, because of the solar industry, uh, the solar roof industry, uh, they're very easily uh, purchased. However, because they're meant to be on the roof, they're going to be very heavy. They're going to have this very heavy glass that's on top of the solar panel. You've got the frame around it to be able to mount to it. So that's a consideration. There are some sources that are in this presentation for you. Jen. I have a question on the, if you have the commercial panels like that with the frame on them. I noticed a few of the teams last year had taken off the aluminum around it and kind of built their own ladder uh, support for it. Have y'all ever done that yourself? How hard is that to get off? And do you have any experience with that? I guess is a question. Uh, I personally don't have any experience with taking the frame apart. 
Uh, for me, I felt that the aluminum framing around the, the panel is less of a weight issue than the glass that's on top of it. But that's just my experience. The, the panel weighs like 30 pounds, and the frame is like a pound. So really not much. They come off easy because it's uh, just uh, some screws and you can remove it. It's a channel and uh, just some uh, some plastic, some rubber there, just holding it, you know. So it comes out easy. I took them out one time and put them back in because it's not worth it. How about the glass? Is that laminated on? It's laminated. You cannot peel it out. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So, and then that's the thing. I, I think teams may consider removing the frame and putting their own if they're really trying to optimize like every pound of weight. But then you may not even look at prefab panels at that point. You might go custom, you know, to, to try to minimize the, the weight there. Um, these things are nice though because, um, you know, because they're, they're intended to be mounted somewhere. All you have to do is run a few rails and, and, and you can set them in there. It's very easy to integrate. Um, if you do intend to use pre uh, prefabricated panels, you have to consider that in your design fairly early on because you need to say, I'm going to choose this solar panel and then I'm going to build a frame around it. You know, and, and that really determines the dimension of your car and you'll have to pick up the solar panel framing uh, at different points. And so you, you, you do want to make that decision fairly early on. Um, one of the things you need to know is the rules talk about a limit in the efficiency of the solar panels in the classic division. And we talked about that a uh, bit yesterday. You are limited to 19% uh, or less. When you use prefabricated panels, uh, we measure the efficiency based off of the module, the, the panel itself, not the cell efficiency, the individual solar cells. And the difference between that is the module, you'll see there is a border around it. There are spacing in between the cells that produce no energy. And so uh, there is surface area that, that don't count for your efficiency. So you may have cells in a prefabricated panel that's 20 and a half, 21%, but when integrated into a panel, goes down to 19, and that would be legal for the classic division. <clears throat> so the alternative to a prefabricated panel would be a custom panel. Uh, the, we, we talk about this as a, a pre-made lightweight option. Um, this particular vendor, SBM Solar, they do have some prefabricated uh, panels, but they also do custom. Um, what that means is you can tell SBM Solar, hey, I want a panel that has an 8x5 configuration, and that'll fit the size of, um, of my car. You know, I, I, I can say, and I, you know, I may want to have two designs. That, here's an 8x5 design, and then an 8x3 design. You can tell them the, the configuration you want, and they'll mount the cells that you want on the panel put a very lightweight laminate on top so the, these panels are going to be fairly uh, light. What teams have done uh, recently that I've seen more of is the mix between these two. There are some things uh, called, they call them flexible solar modules. Um, they are typically used in a uh, marine application to put on boats. They are not as heavy weight as these things that go on the roof. There's no big frame. They don't have a big piece of glass on the top, but they are really much closer to this. Uh, they typically have a junction box on, on, on the front. I wish I had a picture of that. Um, but that's, that's definitely a, a possible way to go. Um, the Walden Solar Car team used a company called Windy Nation that sells these uh, flexible 100 watt uh, solar uh, modules. 
Um, uh, there, are, there are multiple <laughs> local vendors that essentially integrate these sun power solar cells into these type of uh, modules. And it gets you uh, a, a cheaper option than making custom ones, but not the weight of a prefabricated you know, metal frame. So that's definitely something that we have seen a lot of cars start moving to. Um, <clears throat> raw cells and lamination. I will say we tried to do this very recently. Oh, let, let me say this. Back in 1997, uh, when I was doing uh, this my first year, we wired up our own solar panel. We bought raw solar cells. They were, I think, 12% efficient, and we were very happy with that at the time. And we wired one cell to another, one cell to another. You, you get these little tin ribbons, and you, you just sort of solder on the top of the cell, you flip it over, you, you, you solder on the back of the next cell, and you, you make a whole long chain of that. And we made a jig to make sure all the spacing is the same. And it, it was a neat thing to do in terms of a fabrication. It's like I learned a lot from that, because these solar cells are really thin and very fragile. Uh, we had to account probably for somewhere on the order of like a 20% loss. At, to begin with, we got better. and got down to maybe 10% loss, but you know, you, you put a little pressure on, on the solar cell and it just cracks. So I will say that we tried to do this uh, recently uh, without much success, primarily because we had a very difficult time getting raw cells to begin with. I just don't know, I personally do not know where you can buy raw cells. A lot of these um, solar cell uh, companies want to be dealing with uh, manufacturers that mount them on the panels and then sell them, and so they don't have to go t uh, get, have support for individual end users. So um, if you can find it, sure, uh, you might be able to get it in a, a cheaper way, maybe, uh, but then you have to account for loss and all that stuff. I wouldn't really suggest that. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's probably not something you want to do um, if you um, just to find the problem. You want to if you're using four-inch cells, you want to put four thousand four-inch cells on your eight square meters, and then you want to solder them, and you want four solders on each cell. That's sixteen thousand solders in some kind of clean room with a couple of thousand-dollar laminator. Uh, Except you put them right on the car, which is even crazier <laughs> um, because you're breaking it. And they're, they're not available. They want to sell them to you in airplane packages of 10,000. You need 4,000 or 5 inch cells. You need a couple of 2,500. Um, so it's, uh, it's very difficult to do and it ends up being expensive. And those uh, SBM panels are, wow, they're fantastic. So uh, another option to this uh, would be to contact uh, Suncat Solar. They, if you want, you know, I'm not talking about entry level teams here. If you want top of the line cells, what the colleges are using, and you want to use the Sun Power C60, you know, uh, 20 something percent efficient solar cells, Alan's got them, and they'll he'll he'll. Uh, custom mount them on, on, on whatever substrate that you want with little uh, pyramids to try to you know, maximize the efficiency. That's also a, 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 a contact to do that. He's, when, he's when, up to $22,000 now to do that. So. Yeah, it, it does get expensive. Yeah, we're talking about 20s of thousands of dollars. Though, you know, even on uh, SBM Solar, we're talking about you know, upper single digit thousands, you know, so it does get uh, expensive. I have a question for you, and this is just really like house application more so than our solar cars, but. Oh. The question is this, the, you have the uh, glass plated solar panels, like you showed in that one picture, and then you had those real thin ones that weren't right there. Do, will those hold up better? And like, let's say we have a, a random hell storm here. Okay, the glass ones will still work with less efficiency, but 
uh, you'll have some cracks here and there, whatever the class. But this will this hold up pretty well on a house one, or like if, let's say you put those on a house. I, I wouldn't mount this on a house. Don't uh, the, on these it. things are not intended to take that type of let's say hailstorm or something like that. Uh, you know, during the race, if we get into a rain or hail situation, we'll ask you to put up your car in a, a trailer or something well, like that, protect it in any way. So that type of application, you can do that. On, on a house application, you, you really do need those, uh, the glass to protect you. Because you're not, you're not gonna go climb up on your roof and maintain the thing. You wanna be overbuilt and, and, and just okay. leave them up there once they're installed. So the other ones would be a better option. So um, when we talk about uh, SunCat Solar, I think, uh, aren't these also SunCat Solar applications? So that, that's what they look like. Uh, they, they come in whatever, whatever uh, cell configuration you tell them you want. I want a strip of that size. She'll mount it on the thing. And they're, they're going to be semi-flexible. They'll put some level of substrate on there to allow you to, to yeah, to, to to bend in one direction doesn't quite twist because it'll, it'll crack the cells that way. And the semi-flexible ones that I'm talking about from Windy Nation do the same thing. The, you, can, you can sort of uh, tw twist them to some degree in one direction, definitely not two directions. So when you design your solar car, it's something to consider. Um, yeah, we, we talked about that. So. Uh, this uh, is St. Thomas Academy putting together uh, their solar uh, panel. They, they wired it just like we did, and they put a jig together just like we did. And you can see you've got to put this tin you know, ribbon on the top, and then you have to roll, you have to fold it underneath the cell and, and then solder it on the back. And it's all sorts of problems. But it was a good learning experience. Uh, it, <laughs> Let's say this, um, I have so much respect for handling solar cells after putting an array like that. You, you look at it funny, it cracks on you. So uh, the, the prefabricated stuff, um, you still have to be careful with them, especially the, the, the semi-flexible stuff because they're not mounted on this nice big frame with glass on top. Um, you do need to be careful with them and having the experience of the raw cells you know, we, we knew to take care of the semi-flexible panels, uh, you know, carefully as well. Okay, so once you have your solar panel, um, your solar panel typically isn't going to be running the same voltage as your uh, motor and controller and battery system. So we typically talk about an array voltage and we talk about a system voltage or a battery voltage. And in order to do the conversion, you need what's known as a maximum point power tracker, MPPT. We use power tracker for short. <clears throat> what the power trackers do, not only is it a standard DC-DC converter that converts the, uh, the voltage, there's a particular um, voltage current uh, curve uh, characteristics of each solar cell. And um, based off of temperature, based off of your voltage of your system, there's a particular curve that goes somewhat like this. And uh, what happens is you want to be on that, what we call the knuckle of that curve to maximize your current voltage um, combination to, to maximize your power. These power trackers do that. That's what, what they mean by maximum point power trackers is that it finds the point on that IV curve that maximizes your power. Um, the way it does that is it um, essentially finds the voltage that the, the solar cells want to be at and, and sort of gets the solar cells to operate at that voltage and then does a DC-DC conversion into your system voltage. Um, so, the most common power trackers that teams use are the Outback or other, you know, what we call grid type MVPTs. Um, 
there are pictures. Uh, there, there were pictures outside and in, in the in the uh, in the grid that show uh, a, a black component about yay tall, that wide, that thick. Um, called you know their their outback is is, is a is a common one, um, and what they're intended to do is are they I, I have to remember are they boost or they're they're buck boost yeah. so um, uh, when we use the terms buck or boost it means that if you're in the buck mode you're taking a higher array voltage and bucking it down to your system voltage and then in the boost mode you would uh, take a lower array voltage and boost it to your system voltage so in in the outback it's a it's a buck boost so you can you know do any configuration you want um, those are nice uh, because they're they're fairly uh, uh, rugged you just sort of put it in your system and go it's very easy to integrate into your uh, system however it does have a limitation if you are running more than 48 volts they do not support that um, so if you have a 48 volt system which I would imagine that most uh, beginning teams would be operating at then that's a great selection if you go higher than that uh, you really need to uh, go into uh, the ARLs and that's uh, an, an ARL um, uh, 600B or something like that I think uh, board and uh, those ARL as you can tell is the Australian Energy Research Laboratory which means they come from Australia which means if you want to buy them make sure you allow for enough time to order them and get them drop shipped to you uh, they also like to have uh, money in hand uh, I think Joel was talking about that earlier they like to have money in hand before they ship you a product so uh, you have to wire them some money and then they'll ship you some product to sell um, but they're, they're very efficient contact information is on our buy sell page as well as here so uh, that is um, a, a picture of these ARL power trackers um, you see three of them because in this configuration they just had three zones we talked about zones earlier and they wired those three zones into here and then wired them in parallel out to the batteries <coughs> Um, you don't want to put so what you what you want to do is you want to put the array panels in series together wire them to a power tracker and then the power trackers output is wired in series to your battery the reason you need to do that is the power trackers need to know what voltage it needs to go um, you know charge to and so it's going to want to check the voltage of the entire chain of your battery. So you, you'll wire them in parallel in that way. Okay. Okay. Something else I'll say right here, uh, in the spirit of admitting mistakes and trying to save you money that uh, I, I, I foolishly squandered of ours, is we went with the Outback uh, Solar FM80 Flex Max. Love the thing. It's really great. Uh, and, you know, I'm an electrical engineer, and I shouldn't have let our team make this mistake, but I led them down the path right into the mistake and let the magic smoke out. <laughs> we didn't have any instructions. Um, what we did is we had six of the Panasonic panels that together, you know, individually, they were like 52 or 3 volts or, you know, under ideal uh, conditions. And I was most familiar with grid tied systems. Grid tied systems you can easily put in series far more of these panels and I just foolishly didn't read the instructions so we hooked it up put that in and it worked great for like a few seconds and then the display the started doing this you know kind of uh, acting weird and then we saw a little of the magic smoke leaking out the side of the of the uh, charge controller and I had just helped us fry basically about a $575 controller that cost me about $400 for us to get repaired. Those were limited to 150 volt max. 
and you know I just put about 300 in and so we had to take that get it repaired and then rewire it and have two panels in series and have three sets of those in parallel do not over voltage your charge controller or it'll be one of those things that you're quickly buying another yeah that's definitely a, a common mistake uh, th that is a common mistake that we've seen a lot is uh, little puffs of smoke coming out of power trackers because you know uh, trying to drive it too much so one of the things and I apologize if this was already mentioned is that when you're researching your power trackers they often are sized for a voltage particular voltage or even a particular wattage so when you're deciding how to divide up your array into zones, that also feeds into your decision for power trackers. If you're going to have a large high voltage or high wattage zone, you may only be able to use a certain type of, of tracker. Um, at least back in the day, at least even for AERL, there were several different models that had several different capabilities. And uh, even then, when you got a model, you had to have AERL set it for what your expected uh, current and voltage was going to be. So just something to, to consider when, when you're setting up your zones, that it does have an impact on your power trackers. It can, depending on how you bundle them together. The other thing is that, and, and then I'll hand it back to Shannon, that uh, power trackers, as, as William said, they're, they're just to reiterate, they're also battery monitors. They, they tailor the voltage that's coming out to the system to be ideal for charging those batteries. Um, so you don't want to tend to put those outputs in series or anything like that. You plug the output of the power tracker straight to the positive and negative of the batteries through the fuses and stuff, of course, but they go straight to the battery pack, essentially. Um, and then that way they can monitor the batteries and as you, you pull your system voltage down because you've been driving, the power trackers will automatically tailor the outputs so that you're most efficiently putting power back into those batteries. One other thing I was going to mention on the uh, these charge controllers like this, the commercial ones like the um, Outback or Midnight Solar that we had talked about, a nice thing for us, we went with the, the Outback one, is there's tech support. When things aren't working just like you think, or like in my case, I didn't know at one point when it was working fine, that it really was working fine. Being able to easily call tech support is very helpful. And then the battery monitor piece is another nice thing. They usually, just built in, they'll tell you your voltage, but something we're adding this year is they have like a, uh, a DC monitoring system that you can, uh, that also monitors current in, you know, to the battery, wattage, basically tell, it's like a battery monitor as well. And sort of, we were at the last second last year trying to figure out a third party way of getting there and I didn't even realize they had it. So these commercial systems, that's a nice thing. They'll sell several other components and even some of the things you need for telemetry, um, which can be helpful. Um, one, other, one other thing, uh, one other selection you could make in the power tracker, um, I've, I've used something called um, Jettison. Uh, it's a it's a boost type of uh, power tracker up to 40 volts, but it's a nice small size, about that big. So that's another option you can take. Okay, so you know we talked about um, the 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 array into the power trackers. We're going to talk about the the uh, motors, but we'll take a side to say. You know, one of the things you do need in terms of the race is a low voltage indicator. This is for the auxiliary system. And so you need to have uh, a, an, an audible alarm that tells you when you're under voltage. And so there are places uh, you can get that. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, so once you get into, uh, you know, powering your, you get input power, now you gotta drive your car. So what, what are the options that you have are either uh, brushed or brushless electric motors, and then we'll talk about hub motors as well. Um, brushed motors are, are, are really the most inexpensive option. Uh, they, they are lower overall efficiency, but you know these are uh, motors that uh, essentially have two poles. Um, you just hook up you know, M plus, M minus, 
to your motor control, it's fairly easy to, to integrate. Um, in a brushless electric motor, there are some of that, but a lot of these brushless ones are three phase, and so there's a, a few more connections. Either way, either selection, I think the, the difference between a brush and a brushless option is just a price, and so it's really what you, what you can budget for. Uh, some of the examples that we have, and a lot of these are uh, really used by a lot of teams that we have here. Um, the Briggs & Stratton E-Tech motor, um, Briggs & Stratton got out of the motor business uh, quite a few years ago, but you might still be able to find um, that E-Tech motor is a, is a nice, uh, you know, 48 volt uh, motor that's out there. A lot of, um, I believe it's actually uh, very similar to, to the Lynch, you know, these pancake motors. Uh, they're about yay wide, you know, that, that uh, in, in circumference. Um, so that, that's a nice uh, sort of rock solid um, type of motor. Uh, some of the teams have also used, uh, I think, what they call advanced DC motors, not on this list. They're a lot heavier duty. They're about yay wide, you know, that in circumference. Um, they're pretty hefty, but they're, they're pretty solid as well. Uh, you know, one time we had some loose cable and we had, you know, uh, actually uh, Tom Johnson, one of the advisors of uh, the old Colorado team, uh, had was traveling behind us and saw sparks happening behind us and you know we, we just sort of tightened it up and motor kept going so you know there is some of that but a lot of teams are really moving towards the, the e-tech or the PMG 132 uh, per motor and here are some places in which you can uh, buy those things. Thank yes, Shannon. One of the, one other thing here um, for our team last year we got the, uh, I think it's the ME0709 motor, which is a very common one that uh, a number of teams use. For us, at uh, first, we ordered it from uh, Electric Motorsports and uh, you know, ordered everything for them online. It looks like a neat looking website. And weeks, weeks, and weeks, and weeks, and weeks went by. And like seven weeks later, we had nothing from them. And I had called them like every week or two and uh, just excuse after excuse thunderstruck worked with them no time here comes the motor the equipment and they were just awesome customer service I don't know if on electric motorsport ours was a rare occurrence but I'll just say of the two thunderstruck uh, was excellent to work with and really seemed to care about what you were doing with a you know team like this and really wanted to work with uh, one of the considerations you have to um, you have to have when you when you uh, size your motor, uh, as Joel was talking yesterday, is you really need to know that each motor has a particular optimal efficiency at a particular uh, voltage at a particular uh, RPM. So especially when you consider gearing and what your your speed is you really want to optimize for cruising speed so that your motor is uh, running optimally. Uh, what we have seen a lot is uh, teams have this um, sort of ideal view of, I'm gonna be able to drive 30, 35 miles per hour all day, and so they gear it that way, and they end up driving 20. And then it sort of rolls off the efficiency curve to say, even though your motor is advertised as 90, 92 percent efficient, you're actually running at somewhere closer to a 50 to 60 percent efficiency when you're down at that speed. And so you really need to consider that in both your motor selection and your gearing uh, into the, into the uh, drive wheel. Uh, when we move from uh, motors, uh, and I guess we don't have that, so let's have this discussion now. Um, in the advanced division, uh, you can expand into what we call in-hub motors. Uh, what that is is, you know, these motors, you can see there's a shaft, uh, you, you put a sprocket on there, you, you know, you drive it either via a, a, a chain or a belt, and that's pretty standard for these type of motors. Um, 
In an in-hub motor, you mount the, the hub motor into your wheel and based off of uh, the gap between the rotating part and the non-rotating part of the magnets, um, you can adjust the speed of that. Uh, we used to say that the NGM motor is the, the hub motor you could use. They're no longer in business. And so um, what teams, uh, college teams especially, and then uh, some high school teams have moved to is the Mitsuba uh, motor out of Japan. Um, I have no experience in that particular hub motor, so um, I think uh, the New York team is using the uh, Mitsuba hub motor, so is Liberty Christian. So if you are interested in expanding out to do that, uh, please feel free and contact them. Not they, for new teams. Not for new teams. Yeah, not for new teams, of course. Uh, um, yeah, the, the mount, the mount for the Mitsuba. Uh, they're identical to the NGM, except one is a four volt pattern and one's a five volt pattern. That's the only difference. Yeah. So uh, the the hub motors are, are are a lot more efficient, uh, just because uh, there's there's less you know rotational drag with the chain and the belt things. Uh, but yes, that that really puts you in an advanced division, and that's not where you want to start. You want to start a new team in the classic division. Okay, so. Now you've got a motor, but you've got to be able to drive that motor, and this is what a controller does. Uh, we call this a PWM controller. PWM stands for Pulse Width Modulation. The idea is instead of giving a, a sort of a, a ramp of energy, a Pulse Width Modulation controller is basically a very fast on-off switch. And, and depending on how long you leave the switch on or off, that's how fast you go. So if I have 50% on and 50% off, I'm driving at half the speed. If I put 75% on, 25% off, then you would be driving three quarters speed. So motors like to have either full power or no power. They don't like to have, you know, they, they run at a particular voltage and they like to have a particular current. Um, this particular controller is called the Autrax AXE. Um, it's a very common controller to use. I know that when you buy motors, the, uh, all the vendors will recommend you, here's a controller to go with that motor, but uh, if they don't recommend the Altrax, uh, that is definitely uh, an easy one to integrate. It's got uh, pins for your, uh, your battery and your motor pins, and then there's a set of three pins down at the bottom there for your throttle to be able to go and it just takes a 0 to 5k uh, pod control. Uh, what's nice about the Altrax controller is there is behind this rubber gasket there a serial interface for you to be able to get that in. So that's always a, a, a nice thing to have. Um, so the programmability you can have is you can actually set a sort of ramp. That means if your throttle is open at 5k, you can actually force it to go from zero to five k slowly, and so you can sort of prevent a, a student from sort of uh, just burning out and, and using up all the energy. Uh, here's uh, some brushless motor examples. There's the uh, O907. There's some other mod energy ME ones as we go along as well. Uh, I guess I, I here's the the the, the hub motor we're talking about. And this is the NGM version, not the, the Mitsuba version. Uh, Cost-wise on a hub motor, uh, as we talked about, we were talking about you know, the 20K uh, range for the Mitsuba. Okay, so you have your ray, you hooked it up to your motor controller, um, you can drive your car now. You got other things you gotta put in your car. Um, you've gotta put um, your, your batteries, you got to wire it appropriately. You got to put in disconnects and fuses, and and then you got to put in uh, your auxiliary system as well. On there, what the team has done is that they have completely built their electrical system outside of the car. That way, they know it works before they ever put it into the car. It's a really neat technique. Yeah, um, if you could, you know, in, in in car fabrication, you tend to have this wire harness. And so you can sort of build it outside your car, hook it all up in nice, neat ways, 
and then install it in your car. That would be nice um, if you can do it. If you can bundle things up, as you can see, they, they've sort of, sort of bundled all the wires together so that you have those rat's nest. That's always uh, a nice thing too so that you don't kink something and, and cut some wires. One of the key things uh, about this, when you, when you start talking about wiring and, and cabling, is you've got to use the correct gauge wire for the job. Um, you know, based off of the distance that you're going to run and the, and the current that you're carrying, the, the, the more current you're carrying, the thicker the wire you're going to use, and the longer that you travel, you're going to get more loss. So, two things I would suggest for you is, one, if you're talking about the propulsion stuff, basically from your power trackers to your motor, to your con uh, the motor and motor controller, to your batteries, I expect for the most part you're going to be using number four welding wire. They're nice and thick, they can carry a whole bunch of currents. And the second thing I would say is try to localize your those components, the high current components. If you can put the power tracker near the, the motor, near the batteries, your distances are shorter and you get less uh, voltage drop <laughs> over the distance. Having said that, you do have to account for disconnect switches. Um, the rules require you to have disconnect switches for both your array and your motor to the point in which you essentially have three parallel circuits, the array circuits, the motor circuit, the battery circuit. And when you uh, disconnect the array uh, disconnect switch, uh, it means that your array is no longer charging your batteries. And then when you disconnect, or when you engage the motor disconnect, your motor cannot use the battery you know, power. And obviously when you disengage, when you engage both of them, all three systems are disconnected from one another. You are required to have uh, two uh, parallel sets of disconnect switches, meaning that you have to have an array disconnect and motor disconnect that can um, be engaged by the driver, so in case there, uh, there's an emergency, the driver can shut off the system. And you need to have a pair of disconnect switches to the exterior car so that in case there's a runaway car situation, you can run alongside and slap the disconnect. One of the more recent rules that uh, we have instituted is that your disconnect switches must be push-pull, meaning that you push to disconnect, you pull to uh, re-engage. Uh, there are disconnect switches out there that are rotary that do a, a stop-start. And we had a situation in which we had a runaway car and we were chasing after it and we just couldn't engage that disconnect very well. And so we said, look, you know, um, we just need to have an easy way to disconnect. Push to stop is a very easy way. And so uh, we, we do say you gotta have that. Which basically, uh, unfortunately, drives you to a single vendor, which is the Albright International Big Red Button uh, that's out there, but it's it's very reliable um, switch. It's uh, uh, no. uh, here. I I I will get you one. Oh well, there's. No, that's not what it's key. Hold on. Well, I'll pull one up for you in, in 30 seconds. Yeah. Anyway, uh, it, it looks like this. It, it's a big red button, so we call it. And so those are the, uh, the disconnect switches uh, that you need to install. Here. Uh, sorry, I, I was doing one. So while he's doing that, I'll add one thing. It's, the, it's an Albright switch, and I can't remember the number, but there's really only one that's applicable. So the Albright switch, there's really only one that's applicable to solar car racing, and it is a fairly expensive switch, and you now need a bunch of them. So it's very tempting to go on eBay. eBay sells these switches are ones that look like them. However, they are not rated the same, even if they say they are. So I would highly encourage you to go with the real one. I'm one of probably the few people in this room, I've actually had to use an emergency disconnect switch on an electric vehicle. It is a rather shocking experience when you have a bunch of car batteries in series, how much current those things can do. I had a situation where I had to disconnect it, hit the switch, 
the switch was running about 1400 amps at 96 volts. That is a lot of power. You want to make the switch literally exploded. It did its job and my motorcycle did not continue going, which was concerned, but that's shocking. You don't want to be, it's not a component that you want to cheap out on. You want to get the authentic Albright switches. Yes. Not the unknown ones of unknown origin from, from eBay. I will say, actually, uh, while there is one you can say that is the switch, uh, depending on the voltage that you're running, um, there are really two. There's an ED250, and then there's an ED250B. And so um, if you're running a 96-volt system, you really need to get that B, the, the blowout version of the switch. If you're running 48 or less, uh, the 250 uh, is, is just fine. So, so can I add on that? It's, sorry. So, it's an important thing uh, that I don't think a lot of teams realize that there are voltage ratings on switches. Um, and AC voltage ratings are not the same as DC voltage ratings. This is a low quality picture, but as William pointed out, the ED250A, it says 48 max on there. If you attempt to do this on a 96 volt system, what you can find is even if you push the big red button to, to cut power, the contacts aren't rated for it. You can get arcing across them and it may not actually cut power like you expect it to. A voltage rating determines the maximum amount of voltage you can interrupt or stop. So this switch is saying that it will stop 48 volts max. And that is something that we routinely catch in scrutineering that uh, teams will have put switches in there that aren't rated for the car's operating voltage. So just be aware of that when you order it, that you really do need to size things appropriately. So um, this is also why we ask that when you submit your registration, one of the documents to submit is what disconnects which you're using along with which motor so we can help you identify the problem early enough. Okay. Um, can I get uh, back to my yes. question? Yes, question. I just wanted to share something. We, just for some of the new teams that are getting these switches, we went ahead and purchased two new Albright switches. There's only one when we were looking resource that sells them out of New York. We ordered them last January. By March, we still hadn't received them. And they told us, oh, they're out of stock. Not gonna see them until end of July, August. My team got on and created a, an email to the company in United Kingdom. We had them within two weeks, but I want you to know, stay on top of it. Because there is like only one, two resources. We were uh, grabbing, uh, we actually got our first power or first disconnect from uh, Granger. The problem was that the amperage was not there, you know, it wasn't correct. We went to a company, it's called Eddie's Electronics in Fort Stockton, Texas. Um, they actually gave us everything to build these things. Um, they, they, it was about a thousand dollars to get six disconnects. So it's Eddie's Electronics in Fort Stockton. Okay. Um, the, the next thing I want to talk about, uh, spend a little bit of time on is fuses. Um, so we require that you fuse your, uh, your essentially your battery motor system with a fuse that uh, is, is sized appropriately for your application. So, you know, a particular motor will have a uh, expected peak current draw, you know, it's like it has a particular peak current rating. And so obviously you want to size your your uh, fuse to that uh, particular um, size. The other thing you have to consider with fuse is it has to be rated for the appropriate voltage. And a lot of fuses out there are rated in an AC voltage, which, you know, in this case we're, we're running DC voltage. And so you need to make sure when you source your part that you get an appropriate, you know, DC rated voltage, you know, uh, fuse. Um, so 
when we start planning out the electrical system, you're, you're required by the rules to, uh, to draw up a schematic. And I will have to say that you're actually required to draw it up on the computer, so this will no longer uh, be allowed. Uh, though you're free to work in this way until you formalize your uh, electrical system design. Um, you know, your, your, the layout is fairly similar. You've got, uh, very simple, you've got uh, solar panels wired in series into different power trackers. Uh, you've got some batteries, you've got the array disconnect, you've got your, uh, your motor disconnect, and so on. So you just draw it out and you submit it to us as part of your, um, your registration submission. Okay? And when you get to scrutineering, you're going to have to take that diagram and show the judges, here's what I drew out, here it is in the car. You'd be surprised how many people come with a schematic. It's totally different than what's installed in the car. Yeah. So personal experience on that, as, as Doc says, if you want to find a good way to lose time in scrutineering, don't come with a good schematic because they will actually make you go back and correct it so it matches the car. And that's time you could be spending going through other stations to get into the event. Aside from that, I don't know of any team that is ever put together an electrical system in the car that has not had problems, including my own. And I, I did the electrical for three cars. I never once got it right on the first shot. And this is one of the most valuable tools you can have when you don't know what's going on. Jared talked yesterday, yesterday about a systematic approach. This is your roadmap to everything that's in the electrical system. Another thing is neatness. Um, if you have a rat's nest of wires, I can tell you from personal experience, again, it's very hard to track down certain issues. But I don't understand why teams don't have a good schematic when they, they come to scrutineering, just personally. Because it was one of the most valuable tools that I had in the shop when we were putting this together. And when you're buying parts and you're trying to figure out how to use them, this tells you that they all work together ahead of time. So please, please, just spend a little bit of time with your electrical team and the schematic and put it together ahead of time. It will save you so much effort later on. Okay, we have a question in the back there. Does it matter which terminal the fuse is on, or the disconnect is on? Yes. Does it, yeah, does it matter which terminal you put your stop switches on? Your disconnects? Yes. No. You. Question here? Oh yeah, I had a question. Um, I, I got a pretty good idea of everything. <laughs> got a pretty good idea of everything up there, except for the charge and discharge contactor. What is that? And then the stunt shunt. I want to. Sure. Um, the the charge and discharge contactors. Um, sometimes you have um, a battery management system that can help you protect from over voltage or under voltage uh, for a particular uh, battery system. So um, in this case, even though I don't see a, oh no, the BMS is right there. Okay. So in this case, this car has a battery management system that tracks your voltage. And this is probably a, a lithium type of application where um, if you, have over voltage, you could set the batteries on fire. It also doesn't like under voltage as well. It might damage the batteries. And so it keeps track of it and it will do some emergency, you know, co connection or dis uh, disconnection of the circuitry uh, if, you, if you break those bounds. Okay. So that's, that's the charge and discharge contactor. Um, well, the, the array skill and this discharge skill, this is of course the motor disconnect. Um, the shunt. Okay, so um, as, as we heard in Jared's uh, talk, the, the shunt is there for instrumentation purposes where if you've got a, a voltmeter or, or a, sorry, an ammeter, it runs and detects current that goes through that shunt and then helps you measure it. So whenever you buy an ammeter or some type of instrument that counts both uh, current draw and the voltage, 
it'll come with a, a shunt that will convert uh, a particular amount of you know current to a particular voltage difference, and then uh, it'll, the meter will read it that way. That's so, a reading point. That's like a telemetry point. Yeah, that's uh, that's for telemetry purposes. Oops, wrong button. Sorry, ice. Trying to be helpful here and interrupt William's presentation one more time. Uh, it's got to be an easier way to switch these. So there's there's a picture of a shunt. So you can tell here that in this shunt, you got 500 amps to 50 millivolts. It just means that it, it scales it down that way. And the and what happens is it, it measures the these the micro voltage distances between uh, this block and that block with all these fins there. And so um, it just allows you to read the current. So, so it's a current reader. So you yeah. Can be current. Yeah. In that case, every millivolt would be five amps. Sorry, every millivolt would be an amp. Um, but that, that's what the scale is. If it's 500 amps to 50 millivolts, you just divide 500 by 50, and you get one, one millivolt is 10 amps. So that would be a good way to measure your amperage. Right, and, and then that's what you'd feed like back into a pie top or another meter. So when you're reading 10 millivolts, you know you're drawing 50 amps. So uh, if you were to buy a, a COTS, you know, the off-the-shelf uh, ammeter or something like that, uh, you could, uh, they, they usually say either it comes with a shunt or it says buy this shunt to, to scale it in this appropriate way. Uh, the, the, one of the things you can use, there's a particular program that you can use to draw your schematics. They have all the symbols like a potentiometer here or, or a DC-DC converter, not that you would use one in your solar car. That's, uh, all, the, all the particular symbols are on, on that piece of software. Yes? Was the previous schematic also made with this software? Um, it's made with a piece of software. I'm not sure which one this particular one. It doesn't look like this right. here. So um, there's there's all sorts of things out there to help to help you do schematics and you know as as our partnership uh, with Siemens grows as they integrate their mentor graphics in there I'm sure uh, we'll move towards doing electrical schematics as well. Okay so another example of everything all integrated together. Uh, fuse right there, there's the motor controller, here's the power tracker and, and the light. And it, this is neat that everything is very accessible, very visible. You know, label the high voltage. Yes, uh, <laughs> you, you label high voltage as required by the rules, you know, things like that. Okay, okay uh, batteries. That's another uh, key thing to consider. Um, I think for beginning teams, you're basically, you know, in the classic division, you're going to be running uh, lead acid batteries. But even still, you have to consider, you know, how many batteries, what your, uh, what voltage are you going to be running at? And I would say, well, your uh, your voltage that you decide on is really driven by your decision on the motor. The motor is going to say. I'm a 48 volt motor, that's how I'm going to run. So you can't run a 36 volt battery pack on a 48 volt you know, motor, it just doesn't work. So um, you know, your, your motor dis, uh, decision is going to play a big role in deciding uh, what batteries and how many uh, batteries you're going to have. Now, you, know, you typically, let's say you run a 48 volt system, you're not going to get a 40 volt, 48 volt battery. You typically, lead acid batteries are going to be coming in 12 volts sizes. You just wire four of them in series. There's your 48 volts. Uh, of course, as we, as we know, given that you're going to be using a certain amount of power, higher voltage means lower current. And that also means that when you run higher voltage and you run lower current, your sizing of the wire could be smaller. If you run very low voltage, let's say, you know, 12 or 24, you're running at very high current and you may even have to go larger than welding cable size, something like an aught or something wire which is going to be huge and, and very heavy. 
So uh, something to consider. The other thing you have to consider is, do I want to maximize the amount of energy I'm allowed to store? It's a trade-off because you are allowed to have five kilowatt hours worth of capacity in your batteries. Well, the more batteries you put in the system, the more weight you're going to carry. And you have to consider, do I want to have the entire five kilowatt hours worth of capacity, or do I want less than that to cut my weight of the car? One of the things uh, my teams have considered is how much energy could I recoup in a day for the, for the, from the solar panels? If I can end the day at a particular time and I can calculate the amount of energy I'm going to get from you know, when I stop the day to when I run out of sun in the morning before I run the day, well, if I get uh, more capacity than what I can charge, then am I carrying a whole bunch of dead weight along the route? That's one consideration. However, you are also allowed to have a full battery pack at the beginning of the race, which means that's free energy that you don't have to worry about solar having to charge. So these are the trade, trade offs you have to consider, and I'm not going to tell you which way you're going to do it. Each team has their way uh, that they would uh, recommend. And we'll talk a little bit about power management uh, later. Um, the, other, the other part of this is there are a lot of different types of batteries and there's a lot of different uh, energy densities. Um, you, you may get different weights of, uh, of batteries uh, for different capacities and you, you want to try to optimize that to minimize your weight and maximize your capacity. Um, one thing not on here, uh, you really want to make sure you get what's called a deep cycle battery. Um, most car batteries are intended to sit at the top, you know, fully charged. And they're really used to start your car, and then once your car is started, your alternator is going to charge it back up to max. So, if you use one of those, as you start going down in your, in, you know, and you drain the batteries, it's not really meant to operate down the bottom. Deep cycle batteries or marine batteries are meant to be able to go fully down and then fully back up and they can run the, the full cycle. So make sure you get what's called a deep cycle battery. Okay. Um, the, the last thing uh, is a road, rater, road race or track race. Um, you, you, that's a consideration in terms of, you know, on a track race, there's a lot of things that are predictable. You know the hours of the day that you can run. You can run from 9 to 12, 2 to 5, or a classic division car. So you know you're going to get two hours in the middle of the day to charge. Um, so you may not need to carry as much capacity because you know you're going to be able to, uh, to charge it up and then use it again. Whereas a road race, you may have to have some amount of reserve because the road might go up, you know, uh, some, some days you may go generally uphill, some days you might go generally downhill. You have to consider that. Let me give another alternative view. When you're on a track race, once you get your car up to speed, then you're going to be driving that until you have to pull it off. Yeah. So you can carry more weight, because once you've got your car moving, then the momentum will carry it forward and you've got greater capacity. If you use that same more weight to go cross country, think about this, we went through the town of Seminole, there were 42 stops and starts before you got in past that town. Every time you have to start, you have to take all of that mass and get it up to speed before you get to the next stop. And the philosophy from the University of Texas team was carry as little as you can adequately charge on a race because you're having to accelerate and stop, accelerate and stop over and over and over again. You don't have to do that on closed track race. Yeah. So you can tell there's lots of different things to consider and lots of this, different things to trade off. We're just bringing this up for you as a team to be able to consider all these factors and determine your team strategy about how to deal with batteries and how to size them. Um, the, we talked about the five kilowatt hour rule. It just 
basically means if you're going to uh, calculate kilowatt hours, it's how many batteries, at what voltage, at what amp hour capacity, multiply them all together, gets your kilowatt hours. Uh, one thing to note, capacity is based on how fast you discharge a battery. That's called the discharge rate. If you discharge faster, you get less capacity. If you discharge slower, you get more capacity. And so we standardize that five kilowatt hours at a 20 hour discharge rate, okay? Some battery manufacturers don't provide that number at a 20 hour discharge rate. They may do it at a 24 hour discharge rate or an 18 hour discharge rate or so on. There are tools online that help you convert the value to the right number. So when you submit your registrations, please submit the uh, relevant documents that say, my capacity is this at a 20 hour discharge rate. Otherwise you get a kickback too. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we want you to submit us all the accurate documents so that we don't come back to you and say, hey, you, you're missing this document, this document's incorrect, and, and so on. We want you to be able to focus on building your car and not having to redo your paperwork. Can, can I add to that? Um, just so you know, if you do show up with more than five kilowatts in the battery pack, it will bar you from competing until something is made so you don't have more than five kilowatts. So you want to be very careful with this calculation and these batteries. I already had one team come up and it asked me for a little bit of help walking them through that because they're looking at two different types of batteries and wanted to know which ones would work. And we walked through the calculation. So be very careful that you double check at the 20 hour discharge rate because we have had teams in the scrutineering before that were over capacity and had to remove batteries from the battery pack in order to enter the event. Okay, uh, as, as we want to do, we want to give you what uh, solar car, lots of solar car teams use. Uh, the Concord Sun Extender Series is a, is a uh, definitely option that people use. Uh, we haven't seen this as much anymore, the Enersys uh, Odyssey. Um, and then there's the, the, the red top and uh, things like that, that might be. Hmm? Red tops are deep simple. No, red tops are deep simple. Yellow top, sorry, some top, right? Uh, so th those are common things. I would suggest that if you're not, if you don't know what you want, start taking a look at the team profiles from all the different years, and you can see some t level of commonality between what teams uh, have used. Um, if you're in the advanced division, uh, lithium batteries, you can uh, get them from battery space, so and there's lots of other vendors that uh, provide those things. Okay, um, so let's take a little uh, conversation about the Pukert's number. Uh, the Pukert number is basically a, a graph as to your discharge rate and the capacity that you have. Um, I think all you really need to know is the idea that the lower the number, the more linear your discharge rate is. So if you have a choice between a 1.3 and a 1.35 Pukers number in your uh, battery selection, you definitely want to go you know, 1.3. That's all I'm going to say about that. Okay, testing your batteries. There's, there's one thing about looking at specs and saying, hey, uh, I've got these spec batteries, they're going to operate this way, and Another thing to say, in reality, every battery is different. So it's important for you to, once you have your batteries, start running some cycles through those batteries and characterizing them. In this case, the St. Thomas Academy team had put together this rig that lets you charge and discharge, well, that lets you essentially discharge the, the batteries in a very known way. It's like, I'm gonna draw you know, X number of light bulbs, which means X number of watts off the battery. And uh, what they have doing is they have some of the junior members start recording over time, this is my voltage, this is my voltage you know, as we go along. 
And you'll find out that as you do the same test with different batteries of this, the same battery type, but different batteries, they'll have diff different discharge characteristics. Some may discharge more or less uh, over time. And so, you, since you're probably going to buy some spare batteries uh, just so that you have them in case there's some failures, you want to characterize those additional batteries and say, okay, choose, if you were going to use a four battery set, let's say 48 volts, right? Choose the best four batteries you, you can use in your car and leave the rest as spares. So it's important, you know, if you have the time to do so, to, to do that and know that each battery is going to be different. Okay? Oh, uh, another thing to note is um, as you record this information, this is the, the information systems uh, thing that Jared was talking about. By understanding how your battery charges and discharges, you have the information that you need to make uh, to, to do your race strategy, right? As you go along, as you get your telemetry during the race, you see how your voltage is going, you see, well, I know that in order to uh, empty my batteries or before my batteries die, I can run, you know, 60 amp hours. Well, you can then use that information and make decisions on how fast to run. Do I need to slow down? Do I need to speed up to use up the energy that's there? So not only do you want to characterize your batteries because they're different, it gives you critical pieces of information uh, for race strategy. The other thing that I note as further incentive to do this, in the case of lead acid deep cycle batteries, a brand new battery will not have the same capacity as a battery you've cycled a few times. If it's called conditioning the battery pack. You want to draw them down, raise them back up, draw them down, raise them back up. After you do the cycle a few times, you'll actually find that the capacity increases in the batteries. It's just breaking them in, conditioning them a little bit. That normally happens as part of you know road testing or a setup like this. Um, either way, just, just a heads up, you get a little bit more if you're not using a brand new battery and if you've cycled them, I think like five to 10 times, you'll, you'll start to see that. Yep. Question. Uh, after you've conditioned the battery, uh, does it have more capacity than it listed says so? So, so I don't know how to answer that. The answer might be maybe, but from a race perspective, we can't judge on things like that. We can't judge on the exact state that the batteries are. What we do to be uniform to every team through scrutineering is go through the manufacturer's published documentation. So that's really what you have to worry about. If uh, you happen to condition them and you get a very good battery pack and you're right on the edge, well, you make good choices. I, it, it, I'll say this, it's unlikely that you will get more than, uh, what's, than spec? what's spec because, well, why would manufacturers spec them to a lower thing when they know that when you condition them it'll be higher. So, uh, you'll, by the way, if, when you start looking at data sheets, you need to look carefully. Uh, you know, uh, battery capacity is one thing, solar cell efficiency is another thing. Uh, sometimes they, they advertise higher than, than they can actually put out. Yes. Um, so you said that conditioning helps with lead acid batteries. Are other forms of batteries, all, do other forms of batteries also respond well to conditioning? It, it, it depends on the individual battery. I, I don't know as well for lithium ion, but I don't think it's the same thing. No. I think <coughs> like laptop batteries, the more you cycle them, the less and less you get eventually over time. Yeah, yeah um, what, what Chris is saying is um, uh, the, the lead acid batteries, you can, they're, they're useful. For, for lithium, they, they don't. Uh, you, you basically, and, and you're actually limited by the num number of cycles actually in a, in a lithium battery anyway. Um, so yeah, that's a consideration. Were there any other questions on batteries? 
you submit to, just a general question, when you submit to scrutiny, so you have to have capital drawings, electrical drawings, the spec sheets for the array, spec sheets for, you submit the spec sheets in step two. Yep. So every time you buy something, you need to keep the spec sheets and everything for it when you turn that in. Okay. Yep. Yep. And there, and you'll see in the rules in section three, here's what we need. And you bring all that with you to scrutinizing as well. But it'll, it'll be submitted as part of your registration documents. That's right. March 1st, you not only turn in for registration, but your copies of the specs for the, I mean, for the motor, for the motor controller, for the, the wheels, and all that kind of thing. So we can look, and if we see something that doesn't seem to be uh, compatible, or so maybe it will cause you a problem, we'll ask you questions. Yeah, so in March, then in June. Look at this as a way of starting a dialogue with you and say, hey, yeah, we have these plans, we can give you some you know, early feedback and say, hey, we're somewhat concerned about this or that, you might want to change this before you get to the race. You don't, we don't want you to show up to a race with a car and say, well, you gotta change this, 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 this in three days of scrutiny. We wanna give you as much you know, uh, advanced notice as possible. Okay, uh, moving on from the main electrical system to auxiliary systems. Uh, you have lights and turn signals. Um, you have to have, you know, uh, forward and rear turn signals. You have to have uh, rear brake lights. You, you have to have the amber ones for the turn signals. You have to have the uh, the red ones for the brakes. Uh, here are some options for you. Uh, in addition to that, which I think is not in this presentation, uh, this is talking about the solar cars, lights, and turn signals. On the road race, your support vehicles need to have a particular set of lights as well. Uh, we mandate that you uh, get these echo lights that you can mount on the back of your chase vehicles. There are two vehicles, right? One right behind the solar car and then one further back. And these echo lights, while expensive, are really key to giving um, cars that approach notice that there's a slower moving caravan ahead. So uh, these are really bright LED lights that flash. You can probably see them from a mile or two away. And so, um, especially as we'll be traveling on highways that are gonna be driven by other cars that are traveling much faster than we are traveling, you need to give enough notice to people, especially if they're in a day state that they're just driving along a, a straight highway, give them notice that there's a slower moving caravan ahead. And so that's the, that's the type of lights that we uh, require. Yes? So we need the echo lights for the chase vehicles, but yes. the lead vehicle? The lead vehicle requires a, a circular uh, amber light that just rotates around. Uh, the, the, they're not as bright, they, they just you know, warn you and say, hey, it's there. That's just to, to tell people, you know, as we come approach them, that we're coming. But and we're really concerned about people approaching from behind. You will also get a solar car ahead sign um, that also tells people what is happening, but the lights really say, hey, look out here, there's something you need to pay attention to. Are there limitations on what the chase and are there limitations on what the chase and lead vehicles can be? So SUVs, regular cars, mini cars, motorcycles. There are no regulations as to the type of vehicle. However, um, you would not be able to have you know multiple trailers in the same caravan. It just gets a really long line of, of cars especially when we talk about, let's say, electric solar uh, power division, you have that separate charging station with that trailer behind you, you wouldn't be able to travel with that in your normal caravan. Um, we are going to update our policies and procedures document as we do every year to give you a heads up as to how we expect the lead and chase vehicles to, to act, and so uh, definitely watch out for that in the coming uh, months. Okay. One of the chase vehicles probably is a truck pulling your trailer, right? And that's a good buffer between anybody who's coming up from behind. Okay. okay. Or a large SUV with half a team. 
So besides the chase vehicle pulling the trailer for the car, are any other trailers allowed uh, either in the lead or a secondary chase vehicle? Just trying to make sure I heard correctly. We're still developing guidelines on that. So uh, just look in the policies and procedures document uh, when it's published. What have you done in the past on that? We state your question. All right, so we bought a trailer for to, to haul the car. So I feel good we've got that. What I we've not yet decided is do we need a, a, a trailer enclosed for any other thing that we're hauling, like a welder, you know, small welder in case something breaks, spare equipment, that type of thing. So what I'm trying to understand is can you have both your trailer for your car and another small spare parts trailer that you're pulling in the caravan? Shannon, in the convoy as you're moving down the road, you've got your lead vehicle, your solar car, and your first chase car. Your second chase car is back a ways so that people can pull in between. If you would want to have another trailer, you would have to travel at a different rate as your other group. It could not be with that group there. Just need to be in the second chase car that's further back. Well, it would have to be. No, it, it would back. not be any one of It would not be the lead, chase one or chase two. It would just be separate. You would just drive it separately. We don't want our, our caravans to be very long because it, it causes issues when, when cars are trying to pass. So you're going to have a compact uh, lead solar car chase you know, convoy and then uh, a, a, a ways back, you're going to have a smaller car as the as a chase too that that people can just pass very very easily. And so that's why uh, trailers like that would be just in separate from this convoy that you have. Yeah. One thing we've considered as an option, and I'm sure we're not the only team that's considering that, is attaching the charging station to our lead vehicle. On the top of the, on the roof, is that something that we would per be permitted to do, or are you saying that the charging station why the would? Lead? Have... Why the lead vehicle? Because that's our trailer. Oh know? yeah, to, to put to put the charging station on the trailer, yes, that is an option. Yeah. And then you, obviously, then your charging station could go along with the caravan. Uh, we have teams that have done that. Yes. It even cost in a, of course another trailer, another another truck, that kind of stuff. Uh, as long as there's one trailer in the convoy. So that charging station trailer would also be the trailer, to, if you need to trailer the car, then yes, you can put that in the caravan, in the convoy. If you have a separate charging trailer and a, and a separate, you know, uh, uh, solar car trailer, then you, they would have to travel separately. Yeah. Shannon. Sorry for some many questions here. No worries. This second chase vehicle, is that uh, always required? Yeah. Yes. Okay. What I was just trying to see is if our lead in, say, uh, the one pulling the trailer was a van, that we had enough people for everyone, do we for sure need a, a second chase vehicle? It, it's, not, it's not really uh, for capacity purposes. It's there to give advance notice to people approaching from behind. You don't want people coming straight up to your, your chase car right behind the solar car if anything happens. You, you want them to have some advance notice that there's something ahead before they get there. So we, we often run on roads that are back roads because we're trying to avoid major areas where there's a whole lot of, of traffic to, to run the cars. But what that means is you typically get local people who are used to doing 50, 60 miles an hour down these roads, and you've got a solar car doing 20. So part of this is to prevent caravans from stacking up so nobody can pass, but the second chase is to give that person that's doing 50 miles an hour some warning before they come up one vehicle short of your solar car so that they can start slowing down, or if it looks like there's gonna be an issue, your second chase can radio forward saying, hey, heads up, somebody's Crazy is back there. Get over to the side. I just want to get it clear in my mind where I can start planning. Yep. So my lead car is like a car, <coughs> or can it be a truck, or sure. a van? Yes. Because be you know. I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to put all my team members. Because if I have a small lead car and then the solar car, and then the truck with the trailer, 
where's my team going to be? That's the size of your vehicle makes no difference. Okay. You have, we, we had a team from Plano that had a Greyhound bus. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. You choose the size of your vehicle. The bigger the vehicle, the more the gas. The summer's gas may be up to three dollars a gallon. So that might be a consideration. But right. anything you want is fun. Any other questions with regard to the, the combo? Okay, I, I'm going to carry along. Uh, we talked about switches and fuses. Uh, so the, the key thing here is that uh, it's rated for DC, not AC. Sorry. Uh, no worries. Can the lead vehicle has the trailer or a trailer? Yes. The chase vehicle, can it have a trailer? Yes. So, you, uh, so, so let, let me answer the question in this way. Wait, hold on. Uh, let me answer the question in this way. Your lead vehicle could be a trailer, or your chase vehicle could be a trailer. They cannot be both trailers. Yes. Got it. Thanks. You can put it in the lead. You can put it in a chase. You can't put it. You can't have two trailers. Thanks. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Carry on. <God. laughs> um, and, and as usual, if there are any other questions, uh, feel free and uh, come up to us afterwards, and we can, you know, engage specifics. But uh, there's lots of material to get through here. Um, we talked about the, the disconnect switches. We talked about the, the fuses and making sure that they're uh, rated for DC uh, at the appropriate uh, current draw. Okay, so uh, now we're going to power on into power management. Okay, so we talked about essentially how you build your car. Now you go, well, how do I have a strategy for running the race? How do I, you know, given that I have a certain amount of energy coming into the, the system, how do I use it? So it depends on, of course, your aerodynamic drag, your rolling friction, your weight, your, your resistance, system resistance, right? So uh, when you think about the strategy, you're gonna get 800 to 1,000 watts of power coming in. How do you use that? You know, if you have 12 hours of usable sunlight, at peak, you're gonna get 9,600 watt hour. That's not really true because beginning of the day, end of the day, you're not gonna get peak power. So you need to characterize that, right? And then uh, we, we say, you know, uh, your, your battery pack, here it says 4,000 watt hours. Really, it's because of the discharge rate, it's derated from a 5,000 watt hour uh, rating. So, if you look at this, um, there's another consideration here is your charging. You're going to have losses in your charging, and so you're going to need more power to dump into your batteries, and especially as you go along, as you try to top off, it takes a lot of energy to try to force the, the last little bit of energy into your battery. So uh, to fully, fully charge your battery, it will take uh, more energy to do so. Okay, uh, the, other, the other consideration is, you know, dead batteries are dead weight, in a sense, right? We're saying, if you're, if you're most of the time in a discharge state um, and you, can't, you, can't, you don't have enough solar to charge it back up, you're just carrying that weight along the road with you. On a road race, especially when you're stopping and starting, that's a consideration. So um, you also need to note that a 48 volt system or a 12 volt battery isn't dead at zero, right? It's, it's completely dead, you know, probably a little under 10 volts, uh, and you just don't have that much uh, usable energy. So you have to you have to account for that and, and track when are you actually fully out of batteries. Okay. Um, if you have a completely dead battery pack, you know if you have full sun, you might take something on the order of five hours to to fully recharge that. So you have to account for that, and especially in your strategy, you don't want to be killing your battery pack at the end of each day. It'd be very hard to uh, fully recharge everything for the next day. 
And of course, you know, as, especially as we go on the road, you're going to have hills which change your sun angle. You're going to have clouds. You're going to have trees that shadow it. So you're not going to get the full peak efficiency, right? So how do you, with all these variables, how do you deal with that? Test, test, test. If you, if you can get your car licensed as an experimental vehicle, which uh, some schools have been able to do uh, on their own, um, you might be able to run on the roads. If not, you can run in parking lots and you can see, well, over the course of days, over whichever time of day, you get this amount of energy that's going on, okay? And then keep a record of current draw versus uh, speed. Um, we uh, did that type of testing when we had our car, and we ran and said, okay, at 20 miles per hour, how much current are we drawing? And uphill and downhill, because we didn't have a level surface to test on. Uh, at 25 miles per hour, what do we, you know, what do we get? At 30 miles per hour, what do we get? And it's not linear. The, the, the faster that you go, it, it's exponentially more current draw, and so you need to find what your, uh, what your sweet spot is. Uh, we, of course, talked about telemetry and collecting data. You know, the very, very basic thing is your voltmeter and your ammeters, uh, although an amp hour counter, which is part of the link 10 or e-meter, uh, really gives you more of a fuel gauge about what's going on. Uh, other people have used this uh, Batman uh, system, which is what this is, uh, it's another type of uh, meter that tracks your amp hour counts. Okay? Okay, so, you know, we, we talked about this, so I'm going to breeze through this. You know, you, you, you're collecting all this information, how do you process it? You know, you get your battery voltage, your, your current draws and things like that, how do you use that? Um, and, we, and we talked a lot about that in the past, so I'm not going to from here, uh, making decisions. So, in this race, typically, the driver does not make decisions on strategy. We say the driver is there to drive and to focus on driving. Uh, typically, teams would have a strategy person or a team that's sitting in the chase vehicle that's calculating and deciding, do I want to drive faster or do I want to drive slower? That's just uh, <laughs> something that the driver shouldn't be trying to calculate in their mind. In that sense, uh, while it's cool to drive a solar car, I've had lots of team members say, I don't want to drive. Just let me do all the fun stuff and calculating strategy. It's a sort of uh, fun. Um, and, and you sort of make the decision. And the driver is essentially a robot that says, hey, go 20 miles per hour or go at 20 amps. Go 25 miles per hour. And then they're just going to translate that into the, to the throttle. So um, just something to, to consider is you got to get, but you got to get the data to the right people. So uh, if you do not have a wireless telemetry system that automatically sends data from your solar car to your chase vehicle, you need to consider how do you get that data back to the decision makers. Uh, some teams, uh, absent of any wireless communication, they have the driver go and say, report, okay, uh, give me a reading now. They'll report, here's my voltage, here's my current draw, you know, here's the voltage on the, on the array, here's the voltage on the motor, and so on. And someone in the, in the chase vehicle starts writing all that information down. Most rudimentary way, it works though, because it keeps your driver engaged, you're, you're, you've got regular radio communications with them. So if you don't have uh, time to institute a, a telemetry system, that's the way to do it. Otherwise, you know, especially with your, with your pine tops, if you have some uh, wireless communication, you can send that information back to your chase vehicle for processing. Okay, so we talked about this in, in the motor selection, and, and I'll repeat it here. You gotta choose the right gearing ratio. So, 
the motors are really meant to be driven at a particular RPM optimally. And so you want to gear it at, at that cruising speed that you, you expect to run. Now, if you haven't built a solar car before, or you haven't built your, this particular solar car before, you don't know how it's going to perform. You don't know how much current is going to be used at a particular speed. So the key part of this is if you have, let's say, a chain drive, be ready to have different size sprockets so that you can adjust. And during your testing, find the optimal front sprocket to rear sprocket ratio that will help you be cruising at the speed that you want to most efficiently. Okay? And so in this case, what's pictured, here's an E-Tech, Briggs & Stratton E-Tech motor with a 15 tooth front and a 70 tooth rear. Um, of course, it, it also gets you a max speed because a motor has a particular max RPM. Um, we tend to see really small front sprockets and as large a sprocket as you can see in the back. Uh, we've run uh, a 1490 before. So uh, that's sort of the, the order of magnitude we're talking about. Okay, uh, here's some sources for some custom sprockets. Uh, you know, for us, we didn't go to these shops. You just go to the local go-kart shop and, and find uh, the number 35 chain uh, sprockets and you can probably find them in different sizes. Uh, some of the sprockets are sort of split sprockets and so you can sort of hammer them together or you can get, you know, solid sprockets that you don't have to worry about trying to align everything just right. Okay. Uh, so, so we're at lunchtime. So uh, we'll come back after lunch and talk about aerodynamics and friction. So, and we'll be up here if you have any questions and concerns about. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Chris, can you stop? <laughs>